Good morning and welcome to WCC. It is good to have you with us today. We're going to get service started in a couple moments. So I'm going to ask that you start making your way towards the seats. Uh, that would be great. It's great to see the fellowship and chatting going on. We, uh, we appreciate coming together as a church. A couple of announcements I want to share with you before the service gets started. Uh, first of all, we want to remind you about John and Sandy Goodlett's short-term missions opportunity that they're going to in Pacochi, Ecuador. They're going to be leaving for February the 17th to the 28th of this year. And there's a list of items that if you'd like to help them on their, on their way, they have some items that they want to take to donate to people there. And so there's a list posted on the front door in the back or at the front entrance in the back as well. And you could take a look at those items if you're able to go purchase them or you have some at home, bring them in. Uh, we're asking that you bring them in by next Sunday, if you're able, please. And then you can put them in this room at the back here uh, where it's, there's a little sign up that says uh, future kitchen. And that's the room we want to store things in just for the time being for uh, John and Sandy. And then also, if you wanted to give financially to help them out on that trip, uh, you could by maybe writing a check and it'd be um, designated to ER, which is extreme response. And those funds would go to extreme response and they'd be used to help in building materials in Ecuador and uh, for children's supplies. So if you wanted to help out by supporting them financially, uh, you could submit a check that way. Chat with myself or John as well. If you have well, you know, a lot more information about that, we'd be happy to kind of help you understand how to donate supplies or to give financially that way. Uh, but again, we want to just hold up John and Sandy in prayer as well as they go out to Ecuador and as they plan this uh, trip in the next couple of weeks. Secondly, we uh, want to make mention of our event, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? And that's going to be taking place next Saturday, it's February the 10th. And dinner will be scheduled for 5 o'clock and then dessert 7 o'clock here at the church. And then the way it works, of course, I've, I've mentioned this a couple of times now, uh, you sign up to be either a guest or a host. And the idea is, is that if you're a host, you don't know who's coming to dinner until they arrive the night of. If you sign up as a guest, you don't know whose house you're going to until maybe the night of or, or the day before, whenever my wife decides to send that information out to each of you. And uh, anyway, schedule dinner for 5 o'clock and then come back to the church for 7 o'clock and we'll have dessert all together as a group. And uh, so if you'd like to be part of that event, please sign up. We really need to know by today or tomorrow uh, who's going to be involved and who's signed up for that. So if you haven't signed up yet and you'd like to be part of it, I'd encourage you to do that. It's a great way uh, to get to know people in the church. Uh, if you're new to the church, to get to know people for the first time. If you've been around the church for a while, to kind of introduce yourself to someone maybe you've never known before. And uh, Stephanie and Wendy are good at kind of matching people up with people who may not ordinarily know each other right from the beginning. So guess who's coming to dinner? If you want to take part in that, please find one of the sign-up sheets in the front hallway and you can sign up for that. Uh, Ruth Ann wanted to let us know as well, and her and a committee are planning a ladies' day out, and that's coming Saturday, April the 20th. So really just save the date for that. There's more information going to be coming. There'll be a guest speaker um, and then a lunch provided as well. And so just kind of save that date, ladies, if you would, uh, April the 20th, 9, 9 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. So it'll be an all-day kind of conference here at the church. And so that's Saturday, April the 20th. And uh, some more details about that will be coming shortly. On a bit of a sad note, we want to make mention of uh, Craig Anderson. His mom actually had a stroke a couple of days ago and is in the hospital at uh, Brantford General. And so we want to just hold them up in prayer, uh, hold their family up in prayer as well, and uh, just be thinking about them. And if you have a chance to be able to encourage them or send them a message, please do. Lastly, I uh, want to just say uh, on, a, on a high note, uh, welcome some new members to the church. This past Wednesday, we had uh, a business meeting here at the church, our annual meeting, and we welcomed into membership Paul and Pam Newland. So we want to just welcome them formally. And uh, are certainly excited, and they've been at the church for a little while now, but it's great to have them in as, as members as well. So we're really excited for them and for us. Uh, to get to know them more. So encourage them and uh, just kind of congratulate them as you see them today as well. Well, as we go before God and open up our time in worship, why don't you stand together with me if you're able. And we'll commit this time to the Lord by going to him in prayer. So let's pray together. 
Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, we want to thank you. As Matt um, has made mention uh, previously to us as we were praying beforehand, uh, just thank you, Father, for the signs of your presence in our lives through the seasons, through the changing of seasons. Uh, Even though we've had a strange winter with temperatures fluctuating, Father, we recognize your sovereign hand in all things. And so we thank you that you're Lord over all. Thank you, Father, that you have sent Christ to be our Savior, that we can gather this morning under the banner of his name, uh, being able to declare that you have reached out to us in love and have rescued us. And so it's with that um, heart of praise and thanksgiving that we come before you this morning. And Father, as we do offer up praise and worship to you, we pray that it would be honoring and glorifying to you. We pray, Father, that as the word is opened up and preached later on, Uh, that you would be honored through the preaching, but that we would receive and understand more about your will for our lives. We do pray, Father, that through this time of praise and worship, that our hearts and lives would be changed, that we'd be renewed on your truth, and that we'd be ready and motivated to set foot in a world around us this coming week with the gospel of Jesus in hand. So, Father, again, we just pray that you be glorified and honored in everything that's said and done. Prepare our hearts now as we come into your presence, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, church family. It's great to be with you this morning. As you join us in song praise as we sing about what Josh just talked about, how God's love came to us. He provided the gift of salvation through death on the cross. So we're going to sing about the cross this morning with hallelujah for the cross and Christ is risen.
Amen. Let's continue worship with Christ is risen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. For I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Hallelujah. Christ has risen from the dead. Hallelujah. Christ has risen. The God who died came back to life, and everything has changed. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, fear, where is your power? disarm you, delivered and redeemed, eternal life is ours, oh praise his name forever, hallelujah, Christ is risen from the grave, hallelujah, Christ is risen from the grave, and all through out eternity our song will be the same hallelujah christ is risen from the grave and on I'll see your scars, your open arms, the beauty of your face. Through tears of joy, I'll lift my voice in everlasting grace. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, fear, where is your power?
Christ is risen from the grave. We're going to continue our worship this morning with a new song, a song that I hope encourages our hearts this morning. It's a song called Abide. It's just a, a testament song to, for us as believers that we are to abide with Christ. But so many things in this world can distract us. But we know in the end, we fully rely on God for everything, for the breath, for our waking breath, for our daily bread. I depend on you. So let's sing the song as a praise, but also a prayer for our own lives. For my waking breath, for my day, Last song we'll sing in preparation for the message this morning is Ferris, Lord Jesus. Ferris, Lord. 
Jesus, ruler of all nature, oh, thou of God and man the Son, thee will I cherish, thee will I honor, thou my soul's glory. you may be seated. We'll have the young children who like to partake in our junior church program. Come on up front. All right, I'm down here with you. Look at that. Surprise, surprise. Uh, we are just going to say a word of prayer and move on, um, partly because we've got a bit of a full service this morning, and so we're going to get you on your way off to junior church. Before we do, though, why don't we just say a quick word of prayer, and then you'll be all set to go, okay? So let's pray together. Well, dear Heavenly Father, we do want to thank you for each one of these little ones. And as they've been growing, Lord, we pray that they would continue to grow in their faith and knowledge of you. We pray that you would grant them saving faith and that those who have already come to know you might grow more in their knowledge and love of who you are. And that, Father, they might live out their faith in the world around them, even in the ways that they can in their families, amongst their friends, and in their schools. We pray, Father, that you would make them witnesses unto your grace and goodness. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, you guys can go. Now, I'm down here for another reason as well. What I want to do this morning is something a little bit different and hopefully a little bit special. And that is uh, we're beginning a new sermon series in the book of Ephesians. And so if you'd like to get your Bibles ready, you're more than welcome to. But Matt and I, uh, we have some booklets that we want to hand out. And these are uh, the text of the book of Ephesians in the English Standard Translation, but they're special journaling booklets as well, and what they help you do is to be able to take notes alongside of the actual text. It's a very simple idea, it's just on one page is the text, and then on the next page next to it is just blank note paper for you to take notes. And again, if you like to take notes, then hopefully you'll find these really, really handy and helpful. I can imagine if you already take notes, you probably have notebooks of your own, but you might still find this kind of thing helpful as well. If you've never taken notes before, maybe this could be a bit of the impetus to say, no, I want to try to do this. And I'll talk a little bit more about why in just a few moments. Um, but one thing that I want to just really encourage you uh, is to think about what is it that God is telling me each and every time that we sit down and have a message like this in a sermon. 
And the other thing is I want to try to give some extra incentive to our young people. So here at WCC, once you hit uh, grade four, you're out of the junior church and you're in with the adults in the message, grade four up to grade 12, of course, and then beyond. What I want to do is try to incentivize a little bit our young people from grade four up to grade 12 in that I want to really encourage you to take up this challenge to just take some notes, some simple notes. And again, I'll give you a little bit more instruction on how you can do that in a moment. But one of my incentives to you young people is this. If you can take notes for four sermons and then present those to me for me to look at and then I'll just initial them. I'm not going to grade them, of course, just to look and see what you did. I'll give you a prize. I'll give you a reward for that. So four sermon notes and you get a reward. If you're able to do 20, again, that's about five months worth then you'll get an even bigger reward. I'll get something a little bit extra for you. Now, it just so happens that the book of Ephesians will take us about 20 sermons to get through. Maybe 18. It kind of depends on how we stretch it out. Um, but that kind of means that you might be able to fill a book like, like this with maybe around 20 sermons worth of notes. So I just want to give you a little bit of incentive, young people. I know that sometimes it can be challenging in the adult service to be able to stay focused and to keep your attention but maybe taking notes is something that you might find helpful. Now, part of the order that I, that I made is still back order. So there's about 20 more of these booklets coming in. So maybe this is something that you want to take a look at. And even if you've never taken notes before, you just want to glance at it to see if it's something you'd like and maybe take it, take it up as a challenge. Uh, if we run out, though, I apologize. Next week, we will, we'll have some more for sure because I know they're on the way. What we want to do, Matt and I, we want to hand them out to the young people first. And then we'll just kind of go through. And if you put your hand up and you want one, We'll come by and grab one for, get one for you as well, all right? So I'll go to our young people first. If you want to take that side, Matt, I'll go this way. Um, yeah. You're very old. Oh, no. Too old for this. Sorry about that. Now, there's Grandma can try one. Okay. You can help her out. We got the, the young people. Did, did Nolan get one back here? Is McKenna in uh, junior church? And Dayton's right there. Okay, good. All right. Are there any other young people? If you're parents and you have young people and you want me to hand one out to you, just kind of throw your hand up real quick. All right. Any of the adults? I'm going to kind of start back here. Randy. There you go. I'll make it up. Give them the one. Anybody else at this point? Yeah, I've got four left for this week, and then again, there'll be more for next if we've run out. Yeah. Matt. Matt, I'm going to give you an extra job, maybe along with Eric, if you don't mind. Would you mind hunting down some pens? Because that was one thing that I didn't, uh, didn't think of ahead of time, that you'll likely, if you, especially if you don't take notes, you're going to need a pen to be able to do that with. So you might look in the office or even the VBS room to check that out. And sorry to kind of throw that on you last second there. All right. Let me give you... Well, let's pray first, actually. Then what I want to do is kind of give you a little bit instruction about what I foresee those little handouts to be helpful with. So let's just pray, and then we'll kind of get into the message for this morning. Heavenly Father, we do want to thank you for your goodness, uh, for the great reminders through those hymns, those songs that we just sung of your grace and your goodness to us through Jesus Christ. As we begin our series here in the book of Ephesians, we pray that you'd help us see your son Jesus even more clearly and the depth of the gospel that's presented. But Father, we pray that you'd help us to live it out. Show us your truth. 
and then convict us and reveal to us how we might live in accordance with your truth. So we need you, Father. We need you to show us in your word this morning uh, your truth and your purpose and will for us that we might know you more and live for you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So again, okay, if you'd like to, you can open up in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, and you have a handout there. Uh, I might refer to it as the weeks go on as the ESV journal. Now, ESV standing for English Standard Version. That's one of the translation, many English translations that we have. It happens to be the translation that I preach out of every Sunday. So one of the reasons why I wanted to get an ESV journal for that is so that it would be the same text that I'm preaching out of. And so as you work through the text there, maybe take notes, you'll be able to see the same exact text that I'm preaching out of, and it'll match up word for word. And so when I maybe even highlight words or, or indicate words that might be significant in the, in the text itself, that'll be easy for you to see and identify. One of the things you might ask is, well, why take notes at all? Um, it's maybe been a long time coming. Well, I, I've been here for about 13 years at the church, and we haven't done anything specifically like this. And some of you will be aware, some of you who are close to me especially will know that I, I kind of have a philosophy against <laughs> PowerPoint presentation for a sermon um, or handing out strict you know, notes for the service. Like you've never received really any pastoral notes from me, fill in the blanks or things like that. I'm just trying to adjust this earpiece here. For some reason, it doesn't quite fit perfectly. Let's see if that works. And one of the reasons why I have that philosophy is because I'm a big believer that when the message comes for the sermon, it's imperative that we be listening. Listening is the most important part of a sermon. It always has been going all the way back to the first century. And even before that, back before there was ever even written text and God was speaking just through prophets, Hearing the word, hearing the spoken word has always been paramount. And that's one of the reasons why I have a philosophy of, well, I don't do PowerPoint up on the screen, or very rarely do I do it, maybe on special occasions. And I typically almost never have handouts that I give because I want our congregation to have a focus on listening. Now that said, the journal that I handed out, I realized many people do like taking their own notes, and some people are the kind of learners that can really benefit from taking notes. If you're like me, I rarely, if ever, will take notes uh, while listening to a sermon as I have opportunity to. I rarely, if ever, do because, again, I really enjoy and appreciate simply listening and taking it in. So if you are the kind of person who says, you know what, pastor, taking notes is just not for me. That's fine. I'm actually in that same camp with you. But I also recognize that it can be helpful to take notes and that many people really, really like to do that. And so I wanted to be able to offer up a tool that would be helpful in that regard. And taking notes can be helpful for a couple of reasons. First of all, it can help you follow the flow of the sermon points and the arguments of the sermon. So one thing that taking notes can do is it can help you kind of follow, hey, what is the pastor saying? How does it match up with the text? Does he have a main objective, a main point, and then does he have other points that kind of follow it? Many of you will be aware that at the very beginning of the message, I almost always say, this is the aim of the message. You've probably heard me say that numerous times. I I say it almost every Sunday. This is the aim of the message. You can consider that the big idea, and that might be something that you would write down in your notes. And then following that big idea, the aim of the message, I'm going to have numerous points. This morning, my points are threefold, and they're as followed. What is an epistle? Who is writing it? And who is it written to? Again, those might be points that you write down. So taking notes can be helpful to follow along the main sermon points of a message and the big idea as well. Sermon notes, I think, can help some people, maybe many people, become more focused on the message and then less distracted by things uh, around them. And then lastly, sermon notes can sometimes provide opportunity to review the message later. Now, we also have our messages recorded and they go up on our YouTube page as well. So those are other ways that you can review them if you'd like or if you happen to miss them. Another question that sometimes comes up, especially from people who have maybe never taken notes before or completely unfamiliar with it is, how exactly do I do this? Or... I could stumble through it if I really want, but what are some good ways or what's some advice on how to take notes? Uh, Let me give you, let me give you at least two methods or two ways to do this. First of all, 
And some of you already do this, and so this is like built into your DNA, and that's great. I love you for that. First of all, you might try to track virtually everything the pastor says. You just love writing down every detail. You have notebooks filled with sermon notes. Uh, you write down the main idea. You write down the points. You write down the subpoints. You like writing down definitions of words that are explained. You might even, if you're really ambitious, try to write down some Greek or Hebrew words as they're occasionally thrown out there. If that's you, then this kind of method is definitely for you. Writing down details. The main idea, what's the aim of the message? Um, you're going to want to write down all the main points as I let them kind of out there. Then you're going to probably write down subpoints with them. That's one way to take notes. And you're going to try to track every little detail. And that's great. That's one way to do it. But then there's another way to go about it. And this is a way that I would really encourage you young people who are maybe first starting out, especially the really young ones in like grade four, five, and six. I'd really encourage you to take notes this way. Try to write down two or three really important truths. That's it. Two or three really important truths. Now, if you're a little bit more ambitious, ambitious than that, then for sure, write down more, however much you want. But I, if you're thinking about, okay, I got to write down sermon notes and, and I want to get a reward after four messages, um, it doesn't have to be massive writing. It doesn't have to be pages and pages of notes. It can be as simple as two or three things that you learned that particular Sunday. Or two things or three things that you feel are just important. Important phrases, important truths. Maybe I'll throw a definition of, the, of a word out there. And you think, that's a really good definition. I'm going to write that down. Two or three important things that you learned in the message. Uh, they could be copied word for word from what I said. Or you could paraphrase them and put them in your own words. That's wonderful. But those are maybe two methods that you could consider. The highly detailed method, where I'm just going to write down everything, or as much as I possibly can, or the more simplified version. I am just going to write down a couple of things that strike me as really, really important. And some of you already tell me that that's the way you take notes. You might even have a little note app up on your phone, and occasionally when uh, the Bible or the pastor says something that you're, you're kind of taken by, you just jot it down really quickly. That's great. Continue to do that. And maybe... Uh, that little notebook will be of great help to you as well in that pursuit. Now, along the way, especially for the first couple of weeks, as some of you, especially the young people, and again, I, I really hope that they can be incentivized to do this, especially for the young people, in the first couple of weeks, you'll probably see me pause a little bit more during the messages than usual and just kind of highlight certain phrases. If you've been to our men's Bible study on Wednesday nights, you, you know that I do this all the time. I, I pause with the men and I'll say, here's something you might want to write down. Here's the way I worded it. And here's the way you might want to word it in your own notes. Uh, I'll probably do that a little bit more during the messages on Sundays, just to give, especially our young people, the opportunity to be able to just hear a little bit clearer what's being said, to be able to understand it and to move forward, being able to remember it a little bit better. And so that incentive, I hope, is going to be helpful for our young people. Uh, one of the things I was talking about with the junior church workers uh, a little bit late, uh, earlier this past year in 2023 was just that it, it can be challenging for our young people to be able to take in an adult-style message, a lecture-style message from the pulpit uh, when attention spans may, be not, may not be as long as an adult. It may be true for you adults, though, too, that attention spans aren't as long as maybe you'd like, and note-taking can be one of the ways that they're helped in that way. So I want to encourage you parents, and especially to encourage your kids. I want to encourage you parents to encourage your kids to take this challenge up. I can't tell you to make it mandatory. Only you can because you're the parents. But I really think that there's great value in incentivizing and encouraging your kids to do something that is only good, right? Only good things can come of it. Again, at the end of the day, they might say, you know what, dad or mom, I'm just really not a note taker. That's not the way I internalize uh, messages. And that's fine. You learn as you've gone. Uh, but I'd really encourage you to give it a shot and to be able to take the messages to heart and to focus just a little bit better. And hopefully that's an encouragement to you parents as well. All right, fair enough. If you have any more questions about that, again, we've got more coming in and we'll be able to get those to you next week if you didn't happen to get one this week. But I think just about everyone did, so that was good. Let's get into the main message then in the book of Ephesians. I'm only going to cover two verses this morning. 
partly because we've already had a lengthy introduction. We also have the Lord's Supper that we're going to be taking up in just a little while. The message this morning is going to be a little bit shorter, and it's going to deal with just two verses as we introduce the book of Ephesians. So if you have your Bibles open there or your notebook, Ephesians chapter 1, and I'm going to read just verses 1 and 2. The Word of God says this, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. As we begin studying the book of Ephesians, it's important to get these introductory notes um, out of the way and understood properly. Questions like, what exactly is this book of the Bible? Who is writing it? And who is it written for? Those are important introductory questions. And if we don't cover those off really well, we're going to struggle to understand the big idea of the book of Ephesians as we move on throughout the rest of it. And again, as many of you are aware, this is a practice we have here at WCC. We preach through books of the Bible. We've preached through the books of First um, and Second Samuel, going back a few years, First and Second Corinthians, the book of Romans, going all the way back to the book of Matthew and the book of Genesis in the Old and New Testament. We kind of alternate back and forth, Old and New Testament alike. So now we're here in the book of Ephesians. Really important as we begin a book study like this that we understand what is this book all about. So first of all, in your Bibles, you probably see that it says the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. In some of your Bibles, it might even say the epistle of Ephesians. And that's because the word epistle it generally means this letter style of writing. But an epistle was a kind of writing that was a little bit more popular back in the ancient world, especially in the uh, day of the Apostle Paul as he was writing this. Now, you might ask them, what is an epistle? What does that mean? What kind of book is the book of Ephesians after all? Well, an epistle is typically a short letter. Now, if you know the New Testament a little bit, you know that these epistles, they come in various lengths and sizes, right? The book of Romans, we might consider a rather lengthier epistle and very deep theologically. Uh, the book of like Philemon, though, is just one page long. It's a very, very short epistle. And then you get books like Ephesians, Philippians, Galatians, Colossians. They're kind of like mid-range epistles, at least by biblical standards, where they're like four to six chapters long. And you could sit down and read the entirety of the book of Ephesians in probably about half an hour or even less. So it doesn't take long to get through this epistle. But we are going to spend a great deal of time studying it. Now, the point of an epistle, the point of writing something like this back in the first century is that there was always some issue, some specific thing, some purpose for addressing the people. Like the Apostle Paul doesn't just sit down and think to himself, you know, I haven't talked to the Ephesians in a while. I think I ought to just send them a correspondence letter to see how they're doing. Now, maybe that kind of letter could exist in the ancient world, but the Apostle Paul always wrote for a reason. Every single letter you find in the New Testament has a purpose. There are typically real practical issues that are going on in the life of that church that are meaningful. And the Apostle Paul knows about them, and so he realizes, I want to speak to these issues, and I want to help the church with certain things that they could be struggling with. And so there are specific purposes that an epistle or a letter is written for. And so what are the purposes of the book of Ephesians. And again, these are some things that you might be interested in writing down if you do like to take notes. The purpose for the book of Ephesians. One of the main purposes, and I think it's spelled out in chapter 1, verse 18, so you could look there really quickly. The Apostle Paul says, Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. One of the main points of the book of Ephesians is to help us become mature in our knowledge of Jesus Christ. And I think this is spelled out in a couple ways throughout the book. To become mature in our knowledge of Jesus, that we would be united together, first of all, united together as Jews and Gentiles. So going back to the first century, you've got to imagine this church in Ephesus, it's made up of primarily Gentiles that are non-Jewish people, of course, but... Christianity began as a Jewish movement in Jerusalem. That's where the first church began. And so Christian faith begins 
out of Judaism with predominantly Jewish people, but it spreads to all other kinds of places in geography. And so now in Ephesus, as many other churches were like this, it's predominantly non-Jewish believers. And one of the problems that churches like that face then were stigmatisms, prejudices from the Jews towards the Gentiles and the Gentiles towards the Jews. And so one of the main things the Apostle Paul does regularly throughout his epistles, and Ephesians is much like this, he wants the people to be united together. So he'll remind them that their faith unites them. There is no longer Jew or Gentile. You are the same in Christ. So one of the main purposes is that our knowledge of Jesus would help us be united together as one church. Secondly, becoming mature in our knowledge of Jesus helps us to live holy lives. Chapter 4, verse 1 says, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Want to live holy lives, practical living for Jesus. And then thirdly, the Apostle Paul wants to give them practical encouragement, hopefulness despite suffering and pain that could be going on around them. But one of the ways he wanted to encourage them was to help comfort them in that while well, the Apostle Paul is currently in prison at this point of writing. So he wants to encourage them that they don't have to worry. He's okay. God has a purpose. Don't be disheartened that I'm in prison. Everything's going to be fine. But he also wants to encourage them that even though they might be entering times of persecution, opposition, pain, and suffering as a Christian, that you can still be hopeful and have the joy of the Lord even in those difficult times. So the purpose of the book of Ephesians is that we would become knowledgeable and mature in who Christ is. That we'd be united together as one church, living holy lives, hopeful and encouraged despite suffering and opposition. So then what you need to know about the book of Ephesians is that Ephesians is a deeply theological book. It really is. It is jam-packed with theology. It's one of the mid-sized or even smaller books of the, of the New Testament. But let me tell you, there is a lot of theology packed into it, which we are going to get into right away in sermon number two next week as we talk about all the spiritual blessings that God has given us in Christ Jesus. There is just so much to be taken from the book of Ephesians. However, the Christian is meant to remember that our knowledge of theology isn't the only thing God wants. He wants us to take the knowledge of theology and use it to live for Him. So the theology of Ephesians is going to challenge our mind. It's going to cause you to maybe go a little bit further and deeper in what you already know about Jesus. But that knowledge isn't meant to end there. It's meant to give you the impetus to go and live for Jesus. So here's something you might be interested in writing down. Theology is important, but it must go along with practice. Theology is important, but we must also practice it. And I believe the book of Ephesians teaches us that the gospel of Jesus is to be lived out together in unity, striving for holiness, being hopeful despite opposition. There's a lot here in the book of Ephesians, and that's just giving you some of the main themes as we begin. But now, the second question is this, who is writing? And of course, I've already alluded to the author, the Apostle Paul. He's the one writing this book, and it says that right at the beginning in chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. So the Apostle Paul is writing. He's perhaps the most famous of the apostles at this point, not least of which because of all the churches he's helped plant all across Asia Minor, uh, Asia Minor and Greece, uh, but because of his incredible conversion story. If you remember the story of the Apostle Paul, if you don't know it, you can go to the book of Acts in Acts chapter 9 and read that a little bit later on your own time. The Apostle Paul is converted from Judaism as an ardent Jewish Pharisee. He was one of the leaders of the Jewish faith, and he was actually completely against Christianity. He hated it, and he was seeking to imprison and kill people who were saying Jesus was the Messiah. So he was actively going out looking for people to imprison and punish and even kill because of their faith in Christ. And then one day, as he's going out to do just that, God appears to him. Jesus appears to him on what we call the Damascus Road. 
And he has changed. He's converted. He's completely transformed. In this meeting with Jesus, he comes to believe and trust him as a savior. And then he's given this mission to go out and to spread the gospel of Jesus now. Can you imagine that? Going from an enemy of Christ, hating Jesus and hating the church, to being transformed into one of its greatest supporters. What an incredible story the Apostle Paul has. One of the most famous apostles here, and he's written um, more books of the New Testament than any other author. The Apostle Paul writes the book of Ephesians, and that word apostle might uh, seem like a word you've never heard of, or maybe it's a word that you've heard of, but you haven't really come to grasp too well. Well, the word apostle means one who is sent out for a specific mission. So if you have, see that word in, in, in verse 1, you might want to circle that word apostle or underline the word apostle. And then a little definition off to the side would be an apostle is one who is sent out for a specific mission. Now, there's a little bit more about an apostle, not just one who's sent out. And some people today think that apostles are just missionaries. Or not just missionaries, but apostles are missionaries. Because missionaries are sent out as well. And they have a specific mission. But you see, the difference between an apostle from the Bible and a missionary like we have today, and we support many of them here at WCC, the difference between an apostle and a missionary is that an apostle had a specific task for the early church in the first century. Let me explain. An apostle was someone chosen by God to help build or lay the foundation of the early church. The Bible itself explains this. The Apostle Paul himself explains this even later on in the book. So if you have your Bible there, you could look Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. He says, The church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. The foundation of the apostles. The apostles have laid a foundation. In the book of 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul describes his ministry in similar terms. In 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10, he says, According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. Now, this term foundation is really, really important because it reminds us the role of an apostle. Yes, they are sent out to spread the gospel, but they are laying a foundation for the church. Now, what does that foundation mean? Well, the foundation that the apostles were laying, it has to do with verifying the truth of the gospel. So as these apostles go out, and you remember some of them, of course, hopefully from maybe your years in Sunday school or just from reading the Bible yourself, the disciples of Jesus, the 12 disciples of Jesus, minus Judas, with Matthias added a little bit later, those 12 disciples of Jesus became the first apostles. And then the apostle Paul became an apostle later as well. Those apostles are responsible for laying the foundation of the early church. And what they were meant to do is, they're going to go out and they are going to verify for people, Jewish people and Gentile people alike, this is the gospel. This is the message of Jesus. It's their responsibility as apostles to confirm to people who might be unaware or might be confused or might have all different kinds of ideas It's their job as apostles. They're going to lay a foundation which says, this is the gospel of Jesus. This is the truth of Jesus. The reason we have the authority to lay this foundation is not simply because God sent us, but because we were there with Jesus. We knew him. We heard from him. He spoke to us personally. We know his teachings well. And in the apostle Paul's case, he met me in a vision and he spoke to me. So I have the authority to help lay this foundation. And the reason why I would argue we we rightly don't have apostles today is because we don't lay further foundations. There is one foundation laid by the apostles that is the person of Jesus Christ, the mission and message of the gospel. And the reason we don't have apostles today is because the message of Jesus has already been confirmed. And we have many of the apostles' writings right here in the New Testament So the foundation is right here before us in God's word. It would be a little bit strange if you found contractors out building houses and building foundation upon foundation upon foundation. That's just not the way it works. You have your foundation people come in, they pour the foundation, they lay it, and then what do you do after that? 
you build on top. But you don't lay a new foundation or a second foundation or one above it or another one above it. And this is the reason why I believe there were only apostles during the time of Christ or the first century. They laid the foundation. And the gift of those apostles was immeasurable to us. Because now we today, not just back in the first century, but we today get to see and read and take in that foundation that is recorded for us in the Word of God. Now what is our job? What do pastors, missionaries, and other churchgoers alike, what do we do with the foundation? We build on it. We don't build a new one. We build on it. And so that's rightly what missionaries today are doing, and pastors today, and other churchgoers. Whenever you go out and share your faith with somebody or help disciple your own children in the knowledge of Jesus, you are building on the foundation. You're not building a new one. There are not apostles who go out today building new foundations. They might call themselves apostles, but I would tell you they are heretics. They are building something other than the gospel of Jesus, or they are completely mistaken in who they are and what the Bible says about apostles. So, Paul is an apostle. He has authority to declare to the Ephesians and to all of us as God's people, what is the message of Jesus? And part of that is recorded here in the book of Ephesians. So he's an apostle. He's building this foundation. And then as I mentioned just a few moments ago, the apostle Paul is almost certainly currently writing from prison, from prison in Rome. And again, if you want to read a little bit more about the Apostle Paul and his missionary journeys and how he ends up in prison at Rome, you could read, again, the book of Acts or specifically the books, uh, the chapter, uh, chapters 18, 19, and 20 in the book of Acts. So Paul is almost certainly writing as a prisoner in Rome. Now, he didn't likely have a jail cell per se. He was almost certainly in like an apartment house arrest kind of situation where he wasn't allowed to leave this house prison. Uh, he was probably guarded day and night, but he had some freedom to move about in that place and to have friends come visit him and to write letters and send letters out. That's one of the reasons why we have some of these. So the books of Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, they're widely considered as prison epistles. Books of the Bible that the Apostle Paul wrote while he was in prison there in Rome, likely around A.D. 62. Again, little details if you like to record, you can, but not absolutely necessary. What's important for us to know is the Apostle Paul was unswerving in his dedication to his role as Apostle. Think about this. He's been chosen by God. He has this important mission to go out, lay the foundation for many, many churches in the area. But not only that, when he's taken prisoner, he knows his job isn't over. Just because he's been taken prisoner and just because he's encountered some very difficult circumstances, Paul's dedication to his role as apostle is completely unswerving. He's passionate about seeing the church established on the truth of the gospel, and he's going to serve the church to his very last breath. So a couple of things we can learn from that are this. First of all, I think we can simply be encouraged by the example of the Apostle Paul to live with the same kind of passion for God's work. Now again, we aren't going to go out and be apostles because we're not going out and establishing a foundation. But we're going to build on the foundation. And we can be encouraged by the example of Paul that no matter what he faced, he was unswerving in his commitment and dedication to the person of Jesus Christ and to help the church. And our encouragement through the Apostle Paul might be very similar. Whatever role God's given you to minister to people, to share your faith, the gospel to others, continue in that. To your very last breath, be a servant of God. Secondly, we are blessed to receive the work of the apostleship of Paul even today. His apostleship may have been limited in time to the first century. But the work of his apostleship, by the grace of God, goes on even to today. The foundation that he and the other apostles established are foundational works that we plant ourselves on even today. 
So some people might say, well, what, if you don't believe that there are any apostles today, well then why does the Bible talk about the gift of apostleship? Well, again, I believe that gift was for the apostles of the first century. But just because there are no more apostles today doesn't mean the church doesn't benefit from the gift of apostleship. We benefit from the gift of apostleship because the foundation was laid and this very church, WCC, is established on the work of the apostles. Not some modern day apostle, but those ancient apostles like Paul. As we come along and we say along with all of those churches from the past, we believe in Christ, we believe in the message of the gospel as revealed through God's apostles. The foundation they laid is the foundation we stand upon. So the gift of apostleship still affects us even today if we know the truth and believe what's been passed on to us. So it's important, church, that we hold fast to the truth of what's been given to us, especially here, of course, in the book of Ephesians. Lastly, the final question for our introduction this morning, who is the book written to? Well, that should be blatantly obvious, as I've already hinted at it numerous times, but it's written to the church that is in Ephesus. He says in verse 1, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Now, because of the nature of the Word of God, these epistles that are written, they get circulated and, and sent out to other churches as well. So we know that this isn't just for the church in Ephesus. It's for every Christian, us included today. But there was a specific church, a specific time, a specific place, and specific issues that the Apostle Paul was speaking to. And this church in Ephesus was one important church that he was ministering to. Paul likely founded the church in Ephesus during his second missionary journey. He revisits it in his third missionary journey. And you can read, again, more about that on your own time if you'd like in Acts chapter 18 and 19. The city itself was well known for its worship of pagan gods. And one pagan god in particular, Artemis, who was thought to bring blessing to people. If you worship the god Artemis, she would bless you. She would make you fruitful in childbearing. She would give you blessing in agriculture and in the marketplace and doing business. So Artemis was the God who brought you blessings. So then it's amazing and powerful that the Apostle Paul says early on in the book of Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. If you want to know where to find blessing, it is in Christ Jesus. Not in some pagan God, not in some other place, not in some earthly endeavor, but in the person of Jesus Christ. And he's going to talk about these blessings and the inheritance that the Christian has time and time again through the book of Ephesians. So Paul knows that this church in Ephesus, they need to be reminded about what God has for them through Christ, not these other foreign pagan gods. And I believe we as a church in the contemporary day, we need to be reminded about where our blessings come from as well. Not from the things out in the world, not from pagan or foreign or idolatrous gods, but from Christ himself. Paul had a very, very close connection with this church. He loved them dearly. It says in Acts 20 that he visits them right before he goes to Jerusalem again. And he knows that he's going to be imprisoned when he goes to Jerusalem. He knows that he's going to be taken captive and that he is going to be stand trial for his faith in Jesus. He's going to end up in Rome one day, imprisoned in Rome. He knows this is going to come to pass. But the last thing he does before he goes to Jerusalem is he visits the elders of Ephesus. He loved this church. He loved this church dearly. And it says in Acts chapter 20 that as he was leaving the elders of Ephesus, he and the elders wept together knowing this would be the last time they would ever see each other. Ephesus was near and dear to the Apostle Paul's heart. And so with it comes some very deep and profound messages that we can take away as well. But then lastly, Ephesus is the first church mentioned in the book of Revelation. Some of you may be aware of this. Ephesus is the very first church mentioned in the book of Revelation. And the Apostle John, he gives messages to seven different churches in the surrounding area of Asia Minor. 
And as he's giving those messages, Ephesus is the first one. And he encourages Ephesus greatly because Ephesus was a bastion of truth in a pagan world. They were standing for the truth. They were weeding out false doctrine. They were putting aside false apostles and false teachers. And they were standing on the truth of Christ. But the Apostle John says of Ephesus, You did well. You did well to stand on the truth. But you've forgotten your first love. You know all the theology. You know what's right and you know what's wrong. You know how to parse all the verbs. You know what all of the chapters of the Bible have to say. But you've forgotten your first love. I believe one of the reasons the book of Ephesians was written and one of the reasons the Apostle Paul writes And yes, I know he wrote before John wrote that to Ephesus. But I think what the Apostle Paul was doing in part was reminding Ephesus and then by nature us even today. Don't forget your first love. That's what you were founded on. The love of Jesus. And serving him because you love him. Not simply because you're commanded to. But because you're so grateful in the knowledge of his salvation. And so the theology that the Apostle Paul is going to present us in the book of Ephesians is important. But he would also remind us, remember your love. Remember what God has done for you. Let that motivate your love. Let that drive your love for him and your love for others. So don't be like Ephesus who eventually forgot their first love. The book of Ephesians teaches us wonderful truths about the work of Christ. This should be cause for great love and admiration towards Jesus. I believe the the repetition of the gospel that we find laid out so clearly in the book of Ephesians, it's a necessary reminder, not only to Ephesus, but to us Christians, of the love we ought to have towards Christ for everything he has done. So then, as we come to the book of Ephesians... Come to the book of Ephesians ready to be challenged with deep theology concerning God's plan of salvation. Come ready to live dedicated to God's purposes for you in light of his gospel. And come ready to be reminded of your first love. The love of Jesus. Following him. Being motivated by the gratefulness and the worshipfulness we have towards what he's done for us. Heavenly Father, as we go to you in prayer now, we do thank you for preserving your word as you've done for so many generations. We thank you for the book of Ephesians. And as we've just kind of wetted our feet now getting into this book, we pray that you would teach us, teach us some deep and profound truths. Help us to see Christ newly and afresh. Help us to understand everything that Jesus has done for us. But Lord, importantly, help us to live it out. Help us to put it into practice in our lives. And help us to be reminded of our first love. And to remain in the love of Jesus. We pray this all in his name. Amen. Well, the first Sunday of the month is when we come and take up the Lord's Supper together. So as we do that, I'm going to ask that two of the men come forward and make themselves ready to help distribute the Lord's Supper together. And uh, as we do so, why don't we just kind of bow and prepare our hearts before God. Our worship team is going to lead us in one more song as we close uh, our service. So if you're able, please stand together and we'll conclude 
by singing, All I Have is Christ. I once was lost in dark as night, yet thought I knew the way, the sin that promised joy and life had led me to Heavenly Father, as we leave this place, we pray that you would indeed give us the grace and the mercy and the conviction from your spirit necessary to live for you, to live out those words, all I have is Christ, that it might be true in our hearts and uh, obvious to those around us that Christ is the center of our lives. Father, we pray that uh, we would honor you with our words and our actions in the coming week, for it's in the name of Jesus we pray these things. Amen. You're dismissed.